Sergeant, so we can start your recordings. We have the PC recording underway. Recording to the cloud has begun. Excellent. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Uh, thank you for joining our legislative hearing today before the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. First, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who are present, Council Member Kalos, Chen, Brennan, and we have also been joined by Council Member Rosenthal. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Council Member Diana Ayala, and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I would like to welcome you to our legislative hearing today on five pieces of legislation. Most of these pieces of uh, legislation focus on labor, as these bills will enhance the city's labor laws and make New York City more labor friendly. I am joined, oh, well, I've already said who I've been joined, I'm sorry, <laughs> at a public hearing uh, held by this committee on April 19th on employment agencies and other labor practice uh, um, placement businesses, we heard testimony from advocates and city residents about widespread exploitation and worker abuse in the construction industry. The committee heard how the labor broker model has become common in the construction industry, where brokers sometimes referred to as body shops supply workers to real estate developers. Body shops often rely on labor of justice affected workers, whether recently released from prison on parole or with a criminal record. Justice affected res um, city residents typically have a difficult time finding steady employment and some parolees may require employment as a condition of their parole. New York City's multi-billion dollar real estate development industry relies on the exploited labor of these formerly incarcerated individuals. Undocumented city residents and guest workers who may lack documentation and deal with language access barriers are also vulnerable to the exploitation of these labor brokers. Although the labor broker model cuts across industries and salary brackets, it is predominantly people of color who are most negatively impacted. At the committee hearing, we heard justice affected city residents describe their experiences working at body shops. They detailed issues of underpayment and how they live on government benefits while working up to seven days a week to survive. They explain how they had to work in unsafe working conditions without proper training and, equi and or equipment. And they feared speaking out because of the possibility of losing their jobs and facing reincarceration. A female employee of a labor broker detailed her experience facing sexual harassment on the job, a case that was eventually substantiated by the investigation by an investigation from the New York Attorney General. I am proud that we are hearing my bill today, intro number 2318, which will license labor brokers and provide labor protection to New Yorkers employed by them. I look forward to hearing from the administration about their perspective on the essential bill. This is this essential bill as well as from unions and workers about how these protections would help ameliorate exploitation in this industry. We are also hearing two bills today from Council Member Rosenthal, Introductions 508 and 974. Introduction 508 would prevent businesses from requiring employees to sign non-compete agreements as a term of their employment. A non-compete prevents an employee who leaves their job from working for a competitive employer or starting a similar business themselves until after a certain amount of time has passed. According to research from the Economic Policy Institute, nearly 30 to 50% of private sector workers are subject to non-compete clauses. The Department of, Treas of the Treasury examined the impact of non-competes and concluded that while they provide certain benefits, they decrease worker bargaining power and induce workers to leave their occupations entirely foregoing accumulated training and experience in their field. According to New York City Bar, uh, to the New York City Bar, has, recommend, has made recommend, uh, recommended legislation to regulate the use of non-competes for low paid workers. Intro 974 would require job advertisements to disclose whether non-disparagement agreements or mandatory arbitration clauses will apply to an employee should an applicant be made a job offer. 
This will help prevent staff from being blindsided by such clauses when they accept the job. Non-disparagement agreements, which prevent employment employees from communicating anything negative about their employer, shield businesses from claims about toxic or abusive workplaces, and keep new employees in the dark about such allegations. Mandatory arbitration clauses bound employees to settle any disputes with their employer through an arbitration process rather than through the court system. Non-disparagement and mandatory arbitration clauses shift power away from the workers, protecting businesses from negative publicity and public court cases, and discouraging employees from seeking redress. More than half of the country's non-union private sector employees are subject to the mandatory arbitration. We are also hearing intro 2397, which would require severance pay for hotel service employees in the event of a closure or a mass layoff. The hotel industry was hit hard by the pandemic and hotel workers are in a precarious state. While hotel owners may look to sell their hotels to recoup their losses, this bill will ensure that hotel workers receive severance. Lastly, we are hearing intro 499, which would expand the eligibility requirement for a new stand license uh, to allow partnerships, corporations, and other business entities to obtain a license. The package of bills that we are hearing today will enhance labor protections for New Yorkers. They will help ameliorate exploitation in the construction industry, reassert workers' rights with their employers, and provide hotel workers with payment in the event of mass layoffs. I am proud that we are hearing this package and look forward to a conversation with the administration about how we can work together on these issues. I'd now like to read a testimony from, opening remarks, actually a statement from Councilmember Kosslewicz who was unable to be with us uh, this afternoon um, regarding her bill. So, uh, okay, Council members, this is Councilmember uh, Kosslewicz statement. On December 11th, 2001, the city council passed intro 0968. It was a bill that I introduced. On December 26, 2001, Mayor Giuliani vetoed the legislation because this veto occurred five days from the end of the 1998-2001 legislative session. The council did not have the ability to consider an override. Today, almost 20 years later, this committee is considering intro 499, uh, is essentially considering the same bill as intro 0968. Intro 0968 contained language authorizing raising the limit on the dollar amount a new stand operator could charge for an item. This increased dollar limit was achieved during the Bloomberg administration and therefore does not appear uh, in intro 499. Except for the raising of the dollar amount, intro 0968 and intro 0499 are basically identical. Currently, an individual can obtain a new stand license. This bill would permit partnership companies and corporations to obtain a new, a, a new stand license as well. Why is this important? Because it would enhance the ability of immigrants to obtain a new stand license and thus become entrepreneurs. There are approximately 300 new stands in operation in our city. These new stands are overwhelmingly operated by immigrants. This is operated, that this is operated but not owned by immigrants. By expanding ownership to um, partnership companies and corporations, the current personal license holder would be given the ability to bring in the operator as a partner. And when the current license holder retires or passes on because of the definition of ownership is to be expanded, the immigrant operator as a partner would have the ability to become sole partner or the immigrant operator in, this, in his capacity as the operator of the new stand will have the ability to buy the license from the licensee. On the current rules, this is not possible. You may ask, doesn't an individual have the ability to apply for a new license at a new location? The short answer is yes. But the reality is that other locations are available because nobody wants them. They are not financially viable locations. The 300 or so desirable locations are all taken. I urge my fellow committee members to sign on to intro 499. In doing so, many who came to this country will be able to realize the American dream. And with that, Oh, we've been joined also by Council Members Yeager uh, and Moya. I'd now like to turn it over to Council Member Rosenthal to deliver opening remarks on her bills. Can someone unmute Council Member Rosenthal? Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she and her. I want to begin by thanking Chair Ayala for holding this hearing and including 
two of my bills, which seek to provide requirements for employment transparency for all workers. Um, I'm especially grateful because I know it was at the last minute. So thank you for that. The pandemic has had devastating impact on our local economy and on working New Yorkers, as especially as more New Yorkers re-enter the workforce, it's critical that all employees are protected um, to every extent possible from abuse and exploitation. Intro 974 is a simple, straightforward, and necessary bill that requires all New York City employers to include notification in job advertisements if a new hire will be expected to sign a mandatory arbitration and or non-disparagement clause in their employment agreement. Non-disparagement clauses can restrict employees from discussing workplace issues and concerns on social media and in other public formats with severe repercussions if they do speak out. My legislation's my legislation helps to protect workers by ensuring that before they accept the job, they can still decide whether they would sign such an agreement and they are fully aware of any restrictions that they will face. As we know, the ability to speak out about issues such as harassment and discrimination is absolutely essential to a safe and healthy workplace. Any potential employee should have the right to decide whether or not they will accept restrictions on speaking publicly about their place of employment before taking the job. This is especially the case because violating the agreements can have resounding financial and legal ramifications. 974 also requires employers to notify job application in advance if they will be required to sign a mandatory arbitration clause. Mandatory arbitration serves to discourage workers from going to court if workplace safety or other labor laws are being violated. Arbitration clauses can also essentially dissolve the protections that workers receive from federal laws such as the Civil Rights Act, the Equal Pay Act, the Whistleblower Protection Act, and the Family and Medical Leave Act. The bottom line is that workers need to know in advance what they will be required to agree to upon accepting a job. My second piece of legislation, Intro 508, prohibits employers from forcing low-wage workers to enter into non-compete agreements as a condition of employment. Low-wage workers, by definition, have to work multiple jobs in order to make a living and restricting workers' ability to survive and improve their lives through additional employment opportunities is a cruel reality faced by many in the food service industry and other sectors. My legislation seeks to end that practice. I wish the city could do more, but transparency is the first step. Thank you again to Chair Ayala and the staff, Stephanie in particular, on the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I also want to thank my staff, Madhuri Shukla and Sarah Crean, for their help in bringing this legislation to the fore. I look forward to um, administration, the administration's and public testimony. And my office welcomes any further feedback on these bills. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. I want to recognize that we've also been joined by Council Members Kuhl and Lander. Um, I will now turn it over to Council Member Moya, prime sponsor of Introduction 2397, to deliver an opening statement. Council Member Moya. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for uh, the great work that you've been doing. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, my bill, Intro 2397, Local Law in Relation to the Severance Pay for uh, Hotel Service Employees. Uh, as you know, our recovery continues to be challenged, and we need to do what we can to protect workers, the very workers that are not only key to mobilizing our local economy, but are the backbone of New York City's uh, tourism economy. 
New York cannot have a fair and full economic recovery if it leaves behind out-of-work employees and families struggling, struggling to make ends meet, especially after having lost their federal unemployment benefits uh, this week. The population that makes up the hospitality industry, the hotel workforce, are precisely the communities hardest hit by COVID. Immigrants, Latinos, Asians, Blacks. So this bill is about protecting these workers' livelihoods and preparing for the true economic recovery. And while most of New York City's hotels have taken steps to reopen from increased uh, safety measures to recalling workers to accommodate increased travel accommodations uh, needs, uh, we need to incentivize the revitalization of New York City's hotel industry by getting workers back to work. Uh, for the hotels that remain fully closed, we want to incentivize an incremental reopening where uh, hotels can choose to either restore at least part of their workforce uh, and available rooms or pay moderate severance uh, to workers that continue to experience unemployment. Uh, these workers have served as ambassadors to our great city and continue to be a vital foundation of our economy. Uh, we cannot leave them behind. Let's do the right thing and ease the pain and reduce the fear that uh, unemployed families uh, are facing. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman Mamoya. Um, I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council Stephanie Jones, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Ayala. I am Stephanie Jones, Counsel to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute till you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panels to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. For all panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Michael Tiger, Deputy General Counsel at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. We will also be joined for questions by Benjamin Holt, Deputy Commissioner at DCWP, and Carlos Ortiz, Director of Legislative Affairs at DCWP. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Administration panelists, do you affirm, please raise your right hands and I'll call on each of you individually. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy General Counsel Tiger. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Holt. I do. Thank you. Director Ortiz. I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Deputy General Counsel Tiger to present his testimony. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Good afternoon, Chair Ayala and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I am Michael Tiger, the Deputy General Counsel for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. I am joined today by Benjamin Holt, Deputy Commissioner of DCWP's Office of Labor Policy and Standards, and Carlos Ortiz, our Director of Legislative Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the suite of legislation for the committee this afternoon. DCWP's mission is to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. We enforce key consumer protection and workplace laws that serve countless New Yorkers throughout the city as well as focus on initiatives that support New Yorkers and communities with low incomes and building wealth and improving their financial health. As you may know, last week, the mayor appointed Peter Hatch as the new commissioner to lead DCWP's work. Commissioner Hatch is no stranger to public service on behalf of New Yorkers, having held critical roles throughout the mayor's tenure in office. Most recently, he served as the city's COVID-19 public-private partnership czar, securing meals and millions in financial assistance to New Yorkers in need. 
Chair Ayala, I know that you and Commissioner Hatch have spoken, and he is eager to work with you and your colleagues on our mutual goals to improve the lives of working families in New York City. Turning toward the legislation at hand today, these bills relate to subjects that span a wide range of the agency's work, from consumer protection and licensing to protecting workers from exploitative business practices. This is all the more vital as our city begins its recovery from the effects of the pandemic. And we work to ensure that that recovery is equitably felt and shared by all New Yorkers. Introduction 499 would allow corporations, partnerships, and other business entities to apply for a new stand license. Currently, the city's administrative code only allows an individual whose principal source of income will be derived from the new stand to apply for a license to operate that new stand. In New York City, there are more than 320 active licensees operating new stands, primarily located in Manhattan. When DCWP receives a new stand license application, we forward the application to the Department of Transportation, which conducts a site review for the proposed new stand, and the Public Design Commission or the Landmarks Preservation Commission, depending on the circumstances of the new stands location. Once DOT and PDC or LPC approve the site of the new stand and the applicant satisfies all other license requirements, such as paying the license fee, DCWP does not have discretion to deny a license application. Following the agency approvals, J.C. Deco, New York City's street furniture franchisee who fabricates, installs, and owns the new stands in which licensees operate, will construct a new stand for which the licensee is required to pay a portion of those costs. We would like to better understand the intent of council's bills, which uh, council member Kozlowitz's statement alludes to, but note that it would allow corporate brick and mortar stores to obtain a license for a nearby new stand and then use that new stand as a sidewalk extension of their stores. Also, if this bill were to be enacted, we would like to discuss with council whether there should be additional requirements for licensees now that more sophisticated business entities would be able to obtain licenses. As one example, it may make sense for council to then require new stands to obtain insurance as the city typically requires for entities given the right to operate in the public space. We look forward to working closely with council on this bill during the legislative process. Introduction 2318 contemplates licensing labor service providers in New York City. At our oversight hearing this past April convened by Chair Ayala regarding employment agencies and body shops, we heard powerful testimony from New Yorkers who have had their basic labor protections violated by unscrupulous so-called labor brokers. As we testified to, workers should never have to suffer through discrimination, harassment, or other violations of their rights and protections. DCWP is committed to enforcing the worker protection laws we are charged with enforcing and to collaborate with, and collaborating with sister agencies and stakeholders with the authority to enforce other vital worker protections. We support the intent of this legislation to protect vulnerable workers, but would like to work with council to ensure the legislation has its intended impact. First, DCWP would like to work with council to better understand the universe of potential licensees this legislation implicates, where those businesses are located, and how they operate in the city. Second, it is our understanding that many of these labor service providers may already be considered employers, meaning that they already have existing obligations to provide a variety of notices and postings of rights relating to minimum wage, over overtime, and other vital worker protections. Therefore, we would like to ensure that there is a clearly defined universe of licensees and that any protections we establish for these workers are not duplicative of state and federal law and will have long-term benefits. These concerns, if not addressed in the legislation, would make licensing and enforcement difficult for the agency. Additionally, the law department is still reviewing the language of this legislation, but we look forward to continue to work with the committee as, we, as the legislative process continues. Introduction 2397 would entitle hotel employees to severance pay during major closures of our hotel. DCWP believes that job stability, both in terms of income 
and scheduling is key to improving the economic lives of New Yorkers. Therefore, in furthering these principles, the administration supports the intent of this legislation. Lastly, introduction 508 would prohibit employers from requiring low wage workers to enter into non-compete agreements and would require disclosure of a non-compete agreement at the beginning of the hiring process for all other employees. Introduction 974 would require employment advertisements to disclose if an employee's contract will include a mandatory arbitration or non-disparagement clause. DCWP supports the goals of these bills as well. We believe that workers with limited resources and limited incomes and workers who perform vital roles for their employer should not be restricted in their employment opportunities because of non-compete agreements. Similarly, mandatory arbitration clauses requiring workers to waive their right to be in court and non-disparagement clauses limiting what workers can say in any dispute with their employer are typically one-sided agreements imposed without consideration or meaningful disclosure to the workers they restrict. These requirements strip workers of legal right, legal rights to enforce their rights, silence workers' voices, and sequester complaints and violations away from the public eye. We look forward to engaging with counsel in the legislative process, and the law department will also continue to review the bill's text. Today's agenda speaks to the many ways DCWP currently works to help New Yorkers, particularly during these difficult times as we recover from the impact of the pandemic. It highlights the importance of having protections for our city's consumers and workers that are common sense and reflective of today's evolving marketplace, such as the recent legislation passed by the council to modernize the city's consumer protection law. As always, we value the council as our partner ensuring that consumer and workers' rights continue to remain a priority for the city. And under the leadership of Commissioner Hatch and Chair Ayala, we hope that our mission to protect and enhance the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create a recovery that works for us all in New York City. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to discussing any questions you may have. Thank you, Deputy General Counsel Tiger. Um, Chair, would you like to begin by asking questions? Yes. Oh, um, okay. Thank you. Um, I believe that Council Member Rosenthal uh, had to leave. So um, is that correct? Is she still here? The Council Member Rosenthal leave? Did we lose her? Okay. Yeah, I believe so. Okay, I was gonna, I was gonna allow her to ask questions first. Okay, um, good, uh, good afternoon, um, Deputy General uh, Tiger. Uh, so I have a question regarding Intro twenty three eighteen. So is it? I, 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 I'm trying to understand what, uh, what you were trying to say in, in your opening remarks. So is it DCWP's position that, as written, the language on the bill makes it difficult to determine who's an operator and who's not? Well, thank you for that question, uh, Chair Ayala. I mean, I think this is, it's a, these are sort of a complex space of different types of arrangements. You know, we license array licensed employment agencies under the New York State General Business Law. Um, temp agencies are exempted from that law. Um, this bill, as we understand it, tends to uh, require licensure of a certain type of temp agencies. So, it's not that it's unclear, it's just that these are complex topics that are, are important and we just, we want to engage in further discussion with you to make sure this maximizes the protection for workers. Understood. I mean, I, I think that when we start, when we first, when we initially uh, began having the conversation on body shops, there was a lot of confusion about what type of of business would be considered or agency would be considered a body shop. Since that time, has DCWP had an opportunity to study the issue a little bit more uh, deeply? Um, are you, do you feel like the agency is in a position where you better understand who the players uh, potentially would be? I mean, I think we're, I mean, and um, my colleague, Mr. Ortiz can sort of comment some, somewhat on some of the outreach we've done to advocates and uh, some of the people that testified at that important oversight hearing that, that you convened. But I mean, we have started to sort of dig into this and that's why we do have some questions based on like 
how the framing of the law is. And this is why we want to engage with you about uh, how best to maximize worker protections. Because I think we're on the same page of trying to protect vulnerable New Yorkers. And so we just want to, we want to continue that discussion as part of the legislative process. Oh, un un understood. Uh, yeah, Chair Ayala, if I could just add in there as well. I, I know um, that, that particular um, oversight hearing that, that you held and chaired was particularly valuable for us in terms of the testimony we received from workers. Um, I think that helped us get an insight into the industries that were really impacted, the communities such as um, folks that were perhaps formerly incarcerated residents. And, and following that, we, we have, you know, we have conducted outreach with, with organizations that testified at that hearing. So I think that is all to say that this legislative process has been helpful and, and we're looking forward to engaging more uh, on this bill. Carlos, have you had conversations also with maybe some of the labor leaders who um, represent some of these workers now? I think if my memory serves correctly, and particularly um, following that hearing, we, we were, we, we engaged with some organizations in Queens, I believe it's new uh, immigrant community empowerment um, to, to address kind of complaints that they had brought forward during that hearing and to follow up on recurrent educational processes we could put in place with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I get, I get the complexity, right. Of trying to identify who's, a, who's who in, 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 and how do you classify, right. Um, what type of business falls under, um, this licensing agreement, but, um, Assuming that we knew who the players were based on the language of the bill, um, would, is DCP uh, comfortable with the, you know, with the language? And feel, would you would you say that we did everything that we could um, to sufficiently protect and shield the uh, the workers um, and to empower them? That's a good question, uh, Chair Ayala. I mean, this is why we, we think it's important to continue this uh, dialogue as we uh, proceed with the legislative process. Because as I, as I mentioned, we're definitely of the same mind of protecting um, these vulnerable workers and make sure they're not exploited by unscrupulous uh, businesses. So, I mean, there are provisions that as we go through the legislative process uh, that we can discuss about how we can strengthen. I mean, one example is the retaliation provision. I mean, that's a very important part of the uh, workers' rights laws that OLPS enforces, and I know it's a soundly a provision that you, um, you included in the draft bill, um, but we have ideas about how that provision could be strengthened. It's something that we would like to engage with you on as the legislative process continues. You probably wouldn't know this, but besides constructions, are you aware of any other industry that uh, labor brokers operate? Um, to, to, be, to be honest, I'm not aware of that as I, as I sit here today, but again, we want to hear from advocates and other labor leaders and we continue to um, serve and can continue to engage with them and continue the dialogue with you and the committee. Understood. Um, I, I, I want to allow some time. I want to recognize Council Member Yeager. Um, Council Member Yeager? Starting Thank time. You. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll use this time uh, to make a brief statement and I'll leave the questions for the end and you can answer them, uh, Mr. Tiger, after my time uh, expires. First, I, I want to express my support of intro 499 um, for very simple reasons. First of all, uh, uh, the main concern uh, that you seem to have in your testimony is we would like to better understand the intent of the council's bill. And I think council member Koslowitz's statement uh, satisfied that. Um, uh, more to the point, uh, this bill passed uh, the New York City Council at a time when the New York City Council had wisdom. So I see it as uh, a no-brainer uh, for us to address this uh, at this time, uh, as this session is at its tail end, and um, uh, give Council Member Kosowitz the uh, courtesies of passing a bill that she's been working on for uh, for the entirety of her time in uh in this legislative body and I think it's appropriate and I think it makes sense and I think she laid out why and I think the committee report lays out why as well. So uh, unless there are more significant uh, issues, uh, I don't have a problem with this bill. I will just point out that you note that it would allow corporate brick and mortar stores to obtain a license for a nearby newsstand and then use that newsstand as a sidewalk extension of their stores. With respect, I find that concern so laughable and I'm trying to hold it in. Today, we allow restaurants to uh, to expand onto the streets, to expand past their footprint, to do whatever they want with no oversight whatsoever. Even a restaurant that opened yesterday 
can do that. Uh, and, you know, under the claim of, well, this is coronavirus pandemic related and restaurants have to recover. So, you know, we're, we've already um, uh, jumped the shark, if you will, uh, with respect to allowing uh, businesses in this city to take over the streets of New York. So I don't find that concern to be uh, that uh, necessarily uh, compelling. With respect to um, uh, introductions 508 and 974, uh, I don't have a problem with uh, disclosures. I think disclosures are a good thing. Uh, I think lawyers like us like disclosures. Um, you know, they set they set the record uh, straight for what is anticipated from both sides. I will, however, take issue with uh, the idea that you have in your testimony that this is an agreement, uh, typically a one-sided agreement imposed without consideration. Uh, that's just not true. The consideration is a job. That's the consideration. In consideration of receiving a job and a paycheck every two weeks, an employee is asked in certain circumstances to tender an agreement that, they can, that they're not going to uh, uh, engage in a damaging uh, behavior to the company, to the employer. This is typical. This is normal. But more to the point, I don't see at all how this council has the legal authority or the moral imperative and authority to pass a bill like this. This is something that we typically do, um, although we're not at the passing stage yet. Uh, this council is is renowned for passing unconstitutional and unlawful bills. And I view this as one. Uh, we do not have the legal authority to step in the way of, of uh, contracts that are entered into at arm's length between two con consenting adults, uh, entities or parties. And I'd be interested as my time is about to expire in a minute, uh, to hear why it is that the department, or if maybe the department has considered that question, uh, whether or not we have the legal authority to do this. And as you know, um, as an attorney uh, at an agency in the city, you've typically, I'm sure, had the experience of seeing our laws uh, thrown out with a hearty chuckle of an enterprising judge, knowing that we've once again overstepped our bounds. Um, and with respect to uh, Council Moya's uh, introduction 2318, um, you know, I think that, I'm sorry, 2397, I think that, that there are very, very significant issues about um, uh, the closure of hotels over the last two years and what happens to those employees. And I think that that's a societal need that we do have to address as a government body, uh, as, as the government of New York City. It's something that we have to look into uh, in a very real way. And I think it has to be holistic. I think it can't just be severance. I think it has to be in a very real way that an agency of this city has to be tasked with finding people jobs uh, when they're losing jobs. Um, you know, this is something that we've seen the last two years. Unemployment has spiked in a very, very high way. And we have people in this city who cannot find a job at a time when unemployment is about to be significantly reduced uh, or just has been significantly reduced because of federal inaction. And we're going to see the same shortly, I believe, over the next several months as people start to run out of their employment time. So it is something that we need to look at holistically, not just in terms of severance pay for hotel employees, but what is this city doing? Time expired. To find, thank you very much. To find to, uh, employment for people in the city who need jobs. And what we ought uh, certainly not do is step in the way. Uh, we should be part of the solution, not the problem. And some of these bills, not 2397, but some of these bills I do find steps in the way of finding employment. So the question that I'll leave you as my time has expired, is whether or not, or why do you, if so, believe that the council has the legal authority to uh, uh, insert itself into an, ad, uh, uh, an arm's length uh, transaction, uh, contractual relationship between two parties? Thank you, uh, council member uh, Yeager for uh, this, your statement and, and uh, that question at the conclusion. We, we and the law department are continuing to review um, intros 508 and 974. Um, and so I'm not prepared today to talk about, um, fair sort enough. Of about that element of those bills. Okay, fair enough. I, I, don't, I don't mean to, Madam Chair, with your permission, I, I don't mean to impose on you a question that you haven't determined uh, that has an answer. Um, and so that's, that's certainly fair. And, and I, I look forward to hearing more about it. But what I would say is that Again, uh, as I've said in the past, you know, the, we can have good intents, I've said in the past about topics generally, we can have good intents. And there are a lot of things that we ought to do in this council uh, 
uh, societally speaking, uh, for the good of the people. But those things are not necessarily within our legal right to do. Just because it's the right thing to do doesn't mean it's the legal thing to do, and we have to be cognizant of that. And with that, Madam Chair, I'm very, very grateful uh, for your indulgence, for allowing me to go back and forth, and I recognize that, uh, that you've recognized that I have a holiday that starts uh, approximately three hours, so I have to go, but I will uh, commit, as you know, Madam Chair, I will review the testimony after the hearing. I, I do do that. I'm a big nerd. Um, I am very grateful to everybody who's taken the time to be here, and thank you very much again, Madam Chair. Thank you. If I may briefly respond to a point that the council member made, um, as, as my colleague said, I think we defer to the law department with respect to the question on legal authority. Um, however, I would point out that limitations on non-compete agreements uh, are not a unique concept in the law. Um, there is a body of case law that's been developed by state court judges um, who have developed criteria for when a non-compete agreement is appropriate and when it is not, and when it will be found void on grounds of being in violation of public policy. Um, and some examples of that include uh, non-compete agreements that are overbroad with respect to the duration or geographic area that they cover, uh, non-compete agreements that do not protect or go to any legitimate business interests. Such, um, so I would, I would just note that we are not talking about an area here where there is no prior history of regulation. Did you want to follow yeah. that up? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I, I will. I will say I recognize that. And, and for example, uh, you know, non-compete clauses on attorneys have been found to violate public policy. Um, you can't keep somebody from practicing law just because you don't want them to. But what I would also say is that when we pass a bill that is a one size fits all law across the board banning non-compete clauses, uh, that, that does not fit within the body of law on, on how courts have reviewed non-compete clauses because those are fact specific inquiries. It, they relate to the, the, uh, the, the topical uh, concerns regarding the actual information that the employee had during the time of uh, being employed at this particular company. It's not something that we can legislate in my view because each time it's a fact specific inquiry. So for example, uh, saying to a, 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 the person who bags your groceries that they can never work for another grocer would surely uh, violate uh, every body of case law on this topic of non-compete clauses. But uh, to tell a clerk in, um, uh, in, a, in a buying situation of buying a, a product for a particular enterprise that you can't work for the same kind of company within this city for the next year, I don't think is necessarily an unfair uh, or uh, violating the public policy of, of non-compete clause uh, case law that, that has established itself in New York. So again, no one size fits all rule. And that's why I'm very, very concerned about the council trying to pass a law that regulates that. And, and just to be clear, again, I'm, I'm not commenting on, on the actual legal authority, but, but this bill is, is limited to uh, low wage workers with respect to any ban on non-compete agreements. It is, it is not a one size, fit, but one size fits all bill that would cover any employee. I read the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member Yeager. Um, I mean, Council Member uh, Rosenthal is not here uh, to, to speak on the bill, but I mean, is, is the, uh, has the department encountered the issue of exploitative employment contract clauses before? Um, is, uh, uh, is this something that, you know, you're, you've been working on? I mean, um, my colleague, Mr. Holt can sort of talk about this um, in greater detail if necessary, but in, this is definitely something we are aware of, um, and this definitely comes up in, in our enforcement of other workplace uh, workers' rights laws, um, especially when we do the uh, when we enforce fair work week protections for uh, fast food workers. Um, we have definitely encountered uh, mandatory arbitration clauses, for example, in in their agreements, um, and so that's not. This is not something that we have systemically researched and, pro and produced a report on, but it's something that we have encountered. Um, ben, is there anything you want to add to that? 
No, th that's right. That uh, mandatory arbitration agreements are the primary example, which we, in, in our enforcement experience, have uh, seen most commonly in the fast food industry. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, yeah, in, in terms of what we have seen, that has been the most, the most prominent example. Um, so does the so I, I mean, does the administration then share the concerns of the council that the clauses disempower workers and protect business interests? I mean, we think broadly speaking, all the three types of clauses that are implicated by the two bills are troubling, are troubling in uh, both theory and in practice. Um, so again, this we do support the intent of these bills, and as we said, and I said to. You know, a top and into uh, Council Member Yeager, we, we're going to engage with the council as the legislative process continues on the bill's text, and the law department is also continuing to review it. Yeah, I I, I, I get Council Member Yeager's point. I think that you know the concern is like you 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 know you're working at a fast food establishment, right? Um, the likelihood of you know becoming unemployed is probably like you know is a little bit higher, right? And you know, your inability to be able to move on to, you know, from McDonald's, you know, from one franchise owner to the, the next or to move over to a Burger King, like it doesn't make any sense to me, especially, you know, in 2021. Um, so I think, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, our right, legislation should it be a one size fits all approach, but I think that there's an intent here, right, that we want to do what we can as a body to really protect, um, you know, those individuals that need protection. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that, that we can get there and, um, you know, uh, look forward to, to continuing to have this conversation. Absolutely. Um, th are there any other members that, that would like to ask questions at this point? No? Okay. Seeing none. I will take the liberty to ask one more uh, regarding the, the hotel severance pay. So does the administration feel like this bill offers appropriate protections to hotel workers um, who are obviously in a precarious state given the status of the hotel industry? Well, I've said for, you know, we, as a, thank you for that question, Chair Al. And as I noted in our testimony, we support this legislation exactly for the reasons um, you noted and Council Member Moya noted about the precarious situation at this particular group of workers are in right now and how important it is um, to make sure that they are economically secure as we all emerge from the pandemic for a better, a better future. Um, our agency has not done specific work on the hotel industry and so is not prepared today to offer additional prescriptions about how to help hotel workers, but that's definitely something that we can engage with this committee on further. I would appreciate that. All right. Um... Unless we have any questions there, I have no further questions. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, seeing no further hands raised, I will turn it to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you a go ahead to begin once they've started the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Danny Coley to testify, followed by John Simmons and then Tierra Williams. Danny? Time starts now. Okay, we'll circle back with Danny in a little bit and see if he's available to testify. So we will move on to John Simmons, followed by Tierra Williams, and then she Green. Uh, John? Time starts now. Good afternoon. 
My name is John Simmons, and I am a proud construction worker. I want to first take the time out to thank Diana Ayala and the entire committee council for allowing me space today to shine some light along with the disturbing news on Body Shop. My story is far from being unique. Unfortunately, there were countless justice affected workers like myself who share many. John, you got muted. We all look forward to finally being free and to be welcomed by predatory employers who are putting the background to employ us. It's like being stripped and raped of who we are. John, I'm sorry. John. I promised myself that I would never return. I was full of determination, hungry for success. Yet it didn't take long to realize that, that, that the system had something else planned for me. I was unemployable in the eyes of the world. There weren't many opportunities for me other than low wage jobs that didn't help cover my basic survival needs. To add insult to the already injured, I ended up at a center, at the Center for Employment Opportunity where they knew that it didn't make a difference what kind of job we got, as long as it would help us maintain our freedom. It was through CEO that I was introduced and wound up working for body shops. What is extremely dangerous is that these body shops know that we have to keep employment in order to maintain our freedom. They are aware that they have the power to send us back to prison. This is used to force us into working in unsafe, unhealthy, and unsanitary conditions. They know we are blocked from working in many other fields, so they drive our wages down and deny us any needed benefits like health care. Many of us knew that the way we were being treated was very unfairly, but we also knew that complaints would lead to retaliation, so we kept quiet as- Time expired. You may proceed, John. We kept quiet as per New York state law. We couldn't even participate in labor protests. There is Shops called Furthermore, it wasn't until I was introduced to the legalized phrase that I finally gained my sense of freedom. Mr. Simmons, you're coming in very muddled. My life. I am finally able to achieve real hope of financial independence. Body shops are a real threat to people like me. Once again, I urge you, the city council, to regulate them and protect those men and women who truly seek a second chance at life. And for knowing that the words of my testimony did not fall upon deaf ears, I want to commend the, the Committee of Consumer Affairs. Mr. Simmons, you're you're coming in very muddled, and you and you just cut off your uh, sound. Into passage. I speak for all body shop workers because I am deaf. I want to thank you, City Council, in advance for making it possible. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Next, we'll call Tiara Williams, followed by She Green, and then Bishop Mitchell Taylor. Tiara? Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Tiara Williams. I'm a member of Local Laborers 79 and an intern with the organizing department. Thank you to the City Council and Chair Ayala for the opportunity to testify today about my experience and ongoing lack of oversight I have um, in the at body shops in the construction industry. I was one of the 18 primarily Black women survivors of sexual abuse or assault who were involved in the Attorney General's landmark $1.5 million sexual harassment settlement against body shop contractor Tradeoff. While employed by Tradeoff, I was subjected to constant harassment. Tradeoff failed to address complaints and instead protected sexual abusers. I know many Black women, formerly incarcerated New Yorkers and also immigrants who also work for non-union labor, brokers, or body shop contractors. These dangerous jobs barely provide enough money for survival. Body shop workers are often desperate and lead in need of work at, after getting released from prison. They must maintain employment as condition of their parole. They face the real threat of re-imprisonment if parole officers discover they are out of work. Complaining about job conditions, sexual harassment, and other mistreatment can cost these workers their freedom. Firms like Tradeoff make big money sending black and brown construction workers to work on development projects for po po poverty wages with little training and no benefits. 
even those offices offering slightly over minimum wage are not doing us any favors. When I was making minimum wage, I, I relied on public assistance benefits. So tax dollars were basically subsidizing the body shop. When I got a small raise, I was kicked off those benefits. So any money I earned went towards paying for health care for my family at the end of the month. We deserve to be treated as human beings, not as bodies to be abused and exploited on contract sites. For black women construction workers like me, unionization and collective bargaining are essential for creating workplaces where contractors and developers treat us with dignity, dignity and respect and providing real family sustaining benefits. Most I'm of inspired. us just want to work. Go ahead, Tiara. Most of us just want to work, stay out of jail, and become good members of the society and pay our taxes. I commend the Committee on the Consumer Affairs and Business License for bringing forward this bill and urge the swift passage of the Body Shop Bill Intro 2318. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tiara. Next, we will call on Shee Green to testify, followed by Bishop Mitchell Taylor and then Han Lu. She? Time starts now. Hi, good. Can you guys see me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon at the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business. My name is Shai Green, and I'm the Executive Director of Pathways to Apprenticeship, a nonprofit organization focused on reentry and other low-income workers that seek to end poverty by providing access to apprenticeships in New York City building trades that lead to solid careers. I'm here today to ask the council to pass the Body Shop Bill Intro 2318. I grew up affected by the justice system. I saw my parents in and out of the justice system. I didn't want my kids to grow up like that. P2A and the construction industry were my opportunity to turn things around. Construction can lift people of color and justice affected by workers, I'm sorry, justice affected workers out of the system of recidivism, but not when employers are, are contributing to the feeding off the cycles of poverty, fear, and fears of incarceration, which is exactly what body shops do. Body shops in the construction industry coerce workers into dangerous jobs for little pay with no benefits. Reentry workers face barriers to employment, housing, and education and take the jobs that they can get. Body shops employees know this and rely upon reentry workers for their workforce because they know these workers have to maintain employment and will do almost anything to get their lives back on track. Doing anything in these situations could mean putting themselves in, physical in physically dangerous situations, accepting extremely low pay, or keeping quiet about wage theft. These employers know workers won't speak out of fear of losing their jobs and being reported to their parole officers for being unable to main maintain employment. That kind of parole violation could land a, a worker back in jail. Construction body shops must be regulated. These companies are ruthless in their exploitation of workers. They do not treat they do not treat them as worthy of a second chance. They use this country's system of mass incarceration as a feeder workforce because they think society will look the other way when it comes to these workers. New York City must show them otherwise Time by cracking labor laws and regulating body shops. I urge council to pass intro 2318. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shai. Next, we'd like to invite Bishop Mitchell Taylor to testify, followed by Han Lu and then Rob Bookman. Bishop Mitchell Taylor. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Bishop Mitchell G. Taylor. I am representing Urban Upbound, an advocacy organization dedicated to breaking cycles of poverty and eliminating the barriers to economic mobility. Thank you, Chair Ayala and all the council members present for holding this hearing on such an important topic. Urban Upbound supports the regulation of firms exploiting vulnerable reentry workers as practices of these agencies are damaging to our community and individual workers. As our city and state move toward implementing criminal justice reforms, it is imperative that legislators assist reentry workers in breaking down barriers to successfully reentering their communities. One of those barriers is the scarcity of work open to those following uh, open to those that are following incarceration. And uh, the use of this to exploit, exploit the vulnerability of their position. Construction is one of the few industries welcoming formerly incarcerated individuals, prompting unscrupulous firms and employers to prey on them. 
body shops have emerged, firms and agencies that are funneling re-entry workers to these non-union firms, offering low wages, little to no benefits, and oftentimes poor safety conditions. These firms damage the financial health of our communities and keep those re-entering society in an impoverished state. Body shops are non-union construction labor brokers that engage in exploitative practices, preying on re-entry workers and offering poverty level wages. These firms are largely unlicensed and profit from using mass incarceration as a feeder system. Sounds familiar. Supplying the city's richest developers with cheap and vulnerable workforce. Body shop contractors employ exploit re-entry workers by taking advantage of their restricted rights following incorporation incarceration, affording them little to no practices and low wages. Body shops foster uh, cyclical poverty um, and, must, and must be regulated to end their abusive practices. Urban Upbound is a staunch supporter of Intro 2318. We must regulate body shops to protect the formerly incarcerated population and their families. Thank you. I wanna thank the city council in advance for their responsibility to act to the end the abuses that are a part of this bill. Thank you again. Thank you, Bishop, and thank you always for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'd like to invite Han Lu to testify, followed by Rob Bookman and then Adwoa Tumasi. Han? Time starts now. Good afternoon. It's my privilege to be testifying in support of Chair Ayala's Introduction 2318. My name is Han Lu. My pronouns are he and they. I'm a senior staff attorney at National Employment Law Project, or NELP. NELP is a national nonprofit law and policy org that advocates for good jobs for all. Our submitted testimony for this hearing and from the related committee hearing on April 19th are more detailed and we're available to provide any additional information, but in brief, the body shop business model benefits from a lack of transparency, both to the public and to their own workers. We have data on a national level that demonstrates that black and Latinx workers are dramatically overrepresented in brokered labor. Labor brokers create two tier workplaces where brokered workers who are paid less, trained less, often work alongside permanent employees. This business model in the case of body shops is particularly egregious because of the well-documented structural racism within the criminal legal system. It's targeting of Black, Latinx, immigrant communities, and people in poverty through a variety of policing and prosecutorial strategies. That list of strategies is very long, but in our case here, it's parole. Columbia University published a recent report concluding that Black and Latinx New, York, New Yorkers are 12 and four times more likely to be reincarcerated while on parole for technical violations, meaning no new criminal offense. New York State's parole system requires people on parole to seek and maintain employment under a threat of reincarceration. Those accused of violating parole rules in New York can be held in jail for several months as allegations are resolved and there's no right to a bail setting. The pressure these workers on parole face to maintain employment is real and well-founded. The point here is that body shops lower the floor for all workers, especially in negotiating work conditions with employers by targeting workers with records for Sounds second fire. tier work. Bill 2318 is a common sense first step in bringing transparency to the opaque and unregulated labor, labor broker industry and protecting workers from being pushed into underpaid and unsafe work. Thank you all for your time and leadership today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Han. Next, we'd like to call Rob Bookman to testify, followed by Adwoa Tomasi and then Betel Sarah. Rob? Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you. I am switching topics here and testifying uh, in favor of uh, Karen Kozowitz's intro number 499. And even though she's not here, I want to thank her for not forgetting about the immigrant sidewalk newsstand operators. This bill, as she said, was passed 20 years ago, almost word for word, almost unanimously by the city council. Uh, Mayor Giuliani, in a, in a peak of uh, political fitness uh, against the city council, waited until after your last meeting to veto it so you didn't have an opportunity to override that veto. And we thank her for remembering uh, the importance of this bill. I submitted written testimony 
Uh, I'll summarize, there are six main reasons why this bill was important then and it's important now. Number one, it's a misinterpretation of the law that requires newsstands operators to be licensed in their individual capacity. We're not aware of any other category which uses the word person, which has been interpreted that way. Everybody else can avail themselves to, be, to the corporation law and form a partnership or a business. Second, it will protect mom and pop newsstand operators from personal liability, which they are exposed to now in a trip and fall, for example, because they can't be a corporation or a partnership. It also makes it much more difficult for them to get insurance to cover for such a, because they're personal. Uh, third, it is pro-worker and pro-immigrant. Right now, of the 320 uh, newsstand operators, uh, you can't, there is no legal system for me to bring in my worker and, and make them an owner. Um, this will allow that to happen, just like you did with vendors recently. This will allow the existing newsstand operators who are aging out to bring in their longstanding workers and make them a, a, an owner, for, and then a, 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 by making them a partner or a shareholder, you know, in the corporation. Um, that is pro-worker, and since most of these people are immigrants, it's a way for them to, to, as the Department of Consumer Affairs said, improve their wealth and improve the lives of working families by making them... Time expired. Uh, just a couple, I'll finish up. Um, it also reduces new newsstand construction because most of the clients that we see, and most of the individuals, they want to become an owner in the existing good newsstands, not spend a lot of money uh, and a lot of time trying to get a location built in a lousy location, often locations that community boards are not in favor of, and Mr. Wallace and, and his company is not in favor of building. So there's good reasons to try to reduce the number of new applications. This bill will do that. Um, and finally, to respond to consumer affairs, it will not impact the two newsstands per person requirement. It's still in the law. So corporations are not going to be taking over newsstands. You still only be allowed to be on two newsstands. It still has to be your principal employment. So the far-fetched concern that uh, counsel from consumer affairs said of a, a nearby store wanting to uh, open up, it will not be allowed, first of all, they could do it now, I suppose, and nobody has done it. We've never heard that. And uh, it still has to be a principal employment. That's not our focus. The focus on this bill is to allow these existing mom and pops and their workers to share ownership and share you know, the benefits of ownership. It's long overdue that we correct uh, uh, Giuliani's veto and pass this bill. And we thank you very much for considering it again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we'd like to call Adwoa Tumasi, followed by Bethel Sarah, and then Skylar Marin. Adwoa? Time starts now. Yes, um, good afternoon. My name is Adwoa Tumasi with Maxwell Hotel and the local assist Hotel Trace Council. I'm a room attendant. And as we all know, hotel industries in in New York City has been hit very hard that right now about sell about 90% of hotels are closed, some permanent and some temporary. The owners, um, I don't know, they drag it. I know that uh, right now things are very slow opening, but some are also trying to not making an attempt to open. Uh, we are, at the moment in limbo, the hotel workers, we do not know what to do uh, when the, our hotels are opening. We are not in the loop. So uh, I'm begging that uh, this bill be passed because there are some of us, a lot of us that we are almost, everybody is hard working. It's not like we don't want to work. We all want to work. So we're begging that this bill pass. Um, at the moment, um, so many people are depending on their, uh, their head of household, and we need, to, um, we need to make money to take care of our household, our children. Right now, our unemployment, my unemployment has exhausted. I'm still looking, we're still looking for jobs, but where? So please. How pass with begging that the hotel industry, uh, the owners at least try and open 
with some capacity. We don't, we're not saying that it should be 100% capacity, but at least some capacity so a lot of us can go to work. This is all I'm asking. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we're, we'll be inviting Bettel Sarah to testify, followed by Skylar Marin and then Derek Bowers. Bettel? Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity today of uh, speaking on behalf of myself and many other people who are presently struggling. Um, my name is uh, Bettel. I live in Harlem with three kids. We're still in school. I'm a single mom raising them. I was working at the New York Hilton Midtown and I've been there for 15 years. Since unemployment ended, simple things like grocery shopping for my kids has become more stressful. I'm worried about being able to provide. I support uh, this hotel bill because it's been really hard for me and my family to make ends meet since being laid off from my job. I'm counting on being hired back to work so that I can keep supporting my family Many New York hotels received millions in federal aids during the pandemic, and now it's time for workers to also get some support when we need it the most. This bill, this is the right thing to do. Thank you so much for your opportunity, Anne. Thank you, Batel. Thank you for your testimony, Batel. Next, we will invite Skylar Marin, followed by Derek Bowers, and then Ed Wallace. Skylar? Time starts now. Thank you. Um, speaking on uh, 2318, um, I just want to start by saying that we are not against the licensing of labor brokers or labor companies. Uh, we do have certain issues that are in the, in the um, proposal, uh, specifically regarding uh, notice of assignment uh, with 24 hours uh, notice to the employees where they're going for their shift. The problem with this is uh, twofold, one being that when employees call out in the morning, if we don't send replacements right away, our clients are then delayed and we can delay the entire construction project, which is very close, costly to everybody, and the entire project will be delayed. Additionally, we receive requests you know, the night before for the next morning if there's a weather emergency, if there's something breaks, if there's some kind of emergency or something that comes up, that we need to dispatch employees to our construction sites as soon as possible. So the 24 hour notice is really not feasible for that. Um, additionally, regarding the unsafe uh, working conditions that were previously brought up, we send our employees to construction sites that are run by general contractors and we send our laborers there. We are not responsible for any unsafe conditions that are there. And if there are any unsafe conditions and we are notified, we take immediate action towards them. All of our employees have the 40 hour SST training that was required by New York City. And they have the safety training to protect themselves. Uh, again, if there is anything that comes up that we are notified about, we take immediate action towards it. Um, additionally, regarding uh, the, the, the wages and everything that uh, was brought up earlier. We pay our employees above minimum wage, which again, it is a minimum wage and we pay them above it. And we work with second chance companies such as CEO and community colleges that work with previously incarcerated individuals. Time expired. You can proceed. Thank you. Uh, and have helped people move up the ladder and get out of homeless shelters and get back on their feet. And once they have gotten the experience and um training with us they move on to bigger and better and uh jobs and positions and trades and unions and more companies so the fact that we're being targeted as trying to take advantage and exploit in previously incarcerated workers it's just not true we are helping them get back on their feet we're helping them become a, a you know better version of themselves we are giving them raises we are promoting them throughout our system and it, it, it's paid off and it definitely helps people. No, thank you. I, yeah, I, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Marin. So, I mean, first of all, um, if, if, an, if an employee that it, you are directing to whatever workforce construction, um, when they get to you prior, prior to, um, to making the connection with the, with the, uh, the construction site, 
is there some sort of orientation where uh, you know potential employees are informed or uh, advised that they should you know uh, that they should report inconsistency that they should report you know safety uh, issues if there's sexual harassment you know at that at that job site or is the onus really on the employee to have you know, to, to, to be willing to come and say, hey, this is what's happening, you know, at my work site. Um, because if I'm, if I'm a parolee and I'm out on the condition that I am keeping an, you know, a, a job that I'm employed, I'm probably gonna be a little bit more reluctant to, um, you know, to come to my employer and, and, and bring these issues up for fear that I may lose my job. So I'm wondering, you know, before you're making that connection and supplying that worker to this entity, are you taking the time to educate them on what their rights are and encouraging them to come to you with feedback? Sure. So uh, when anybody is hired, first of all, they're given the New York State uh, mandatory sexual harassment training that they have to go through. So they are informed about that. And then in our handbook, as well as our onboarding calls with our human resources manager and our hiring managers, they're instructed that if there are any issues to bring to our attention in our handbook, there we have policies and procedures that they go through either the lead labor or foreman on the site, or they go directly to our HR manager. Um, additionally, we're on major construction projects with uh, site safety managers and superintendents, and if, if there are any issues, we're hearing about it, and our employees know that they can come to us with it. Okay. Now, so so is it your position that you're objecting to the bill? Um, I'm not objecting to the licensing. I think the licensing is actually a good thing, and I, I do not disagree with the licensing. I disagree with a lot of things that are being asked in the proposal. Um, like I said, specifically the uh, 24 hours uh, notice of where they're going the next day, um, where when we're being asked to disclose our tax credits that I don't believe is uh, necessary to licensing a, a business to ensure that employees are safe. Uh, we're also being asked to disclose um, our employees' ethnicities and things such as that, which legally we cannot ask them for if they do not want to disclose it to us. Um, there's also something in it that states that we have to publish our client list on a public website, which, again, is not necessary for safety or of employees or having anything to do with their wages. Mm -hmm. it, it's That's just ammunition for unions and other companies to target us and to compete against us and again to protect employees and their rights publishing our information is not necessary whatsoever and are you only i i mean are you only connecting potential employees to construction site work or are there other uh types of work that uh that they're being sent to uh we have two sides of our company uh not most of them are going to construction sites they're laborers uh, we also do janitorial services as well, and they go to completed buildings, and they're janitors, porters, handymen, superintendents, things like that as well. Thank you. That's sure. helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll be inviting Derek Bowers to testify, followed by Sandra Velez, and then Ed Wallace. Derek? Time starts now. Chair Ayala and members of the committee, thank you for allowing us to testify today. My name is Derek Bowers, and I'm the Director of Social Enterprise in New York City for Center for Employment Opportunities. I wish to testify in support of Bill number 2318, but make some suggestions to strengthen this bill. CEO is a nonprofit organization that was founded in New York City in 1996 and provides comprehensive employment support, including immediate access to transitional work, individualized career coaching, and job placement services exclusively to individuals who have recently returned home from incarceration. We are also a longtime member of the ATI Reentry Re Coalition, whose members collectively serve over 20,000 New Yorkers leaving incarceration each year, providing access to employment and other critical services. 
We commend the chair and this committee for your leadership in protecting workers. This bill makes important changes to the licensing process for labor service providers. As written, CO is unsure if we and other nonprofits throughout the city that hire individuals in transitional jobs as part of a job training program but are not employment staffing agencies would be subject to this legislation. But we are fully supportive of the intent of this legislation to improve the licensing process in the city. We want to offer some suggestions to make the process easier for nonprofits to comply with this law, particularly with regard to how entities provide required information to employees in all staff accessible areas and complement systems for complying with the numerous city regulations that many nonprofits have as a city contractor. I don't have time to go through these in two minutes, but they are submitted in writing as part of my official testimony and record. We would also encourage amending the bill so that staffing agencies and employment agencies should be subject to these same licensing requirements. Based on our reading, they appear to be exempt and we are unsure why they are exempt. There is similar vulnerability for workers employed by staffing and employment agencies that this bill seeks to address. Fundamentally, we are fully supportive of the underlying purpose of this legislation, which we believe would help protect workers in the city who are vulnerable to exploitation by unlicensed labor service providers. We have heard feedback from our participants who have experienced or seen others experience exploitation from unlicensed businesses throughout the city, and licensing process enhancements can help address that. We strongly support enacting stronger regulations to prevent labor market exploitation because people returning from incarceration are vulnerable to unscrupulous employers. And we rely on city government regulatory agencies to police businesses and provide the public with information that can help them avoid predatory actors. This legislation would strengthen that process and with suggested changes would streamline the process for complying. We greatly appreciate your leadership and your consideration of this testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Next, we'd like to invite Sandra Velez to testify, followed by Ed Wallace and then James Ursaki. Sandra? Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Velez. I worked at the Roosevelt Hotel. I'm a single mother of three. I've worked at the hotel for 15 years. Um, the hotel closed due to the pandemic. Oh, sorry. I'm due with, you know, closed due to the pandemic. You know, um, I was relying on my unemployment to take care of my kids and my family, you know, put food on my table, pay my rent. Barely. It, 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 it meant, you know, I could pay certain things. It wasn't, I couldn't pay everything, but we, we survived. Um, now that they removed my, they took away their unemployment from us. I really don't know how I'm going to, you know, support my kids, pay my rent, just live in general. I need for the hotel to open. I want to work. I don't want to collect. I'm even thinking of going to welfare because I don't know what else to do. I don't have no income coming in now. I'm, I, I honestly don't know what else to do. So I support this bill. I need this bill to be passed. We need this bill to be passed because we need to go back to work at the Roosevelt. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Next, we'd like to call Ed Wallace to testify, followed by James Versaki, and then Lillian Uribe. Uh, Ed? Time starts now. Ed, you still on mute? There you go. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Ayala and committee members. My name is uh, Edward Wallace. I'm an attorney for J.C. Deco Street Furniture, the DOT franchisee that provides the newsstands as well as bus shelters, all maintained by a union workforce. Um, I just have to say I'm honored to appear before this body where I was once privileged to serve as a member of the New York City Council. We make no objection uh, and recognize Rob Bookman's efforts to the purpose of Intro 499 uh, before you, but we want to provide a context of the on the street state of play of newsstands and ask you to consider even broader reforms to assure that the public and the striving New Yorkers who operate newsstands, many of whom are recently arrived immigrants, as well as the franchisee, my client, are protected. We support improving service, but we oppose inadvertently preying upon hopeful, hardworking people who bet their hard earned cash on a dream that increasingly turns into a nightmare 
for the newsstand licensee and a catastrophic economic loss for the franchisee. And I would note this applies mostly to individuals. So the corporate form for those who can use it uh, may be helpful for them to uh, acquire uh, stable wealth and ability to sell, but not for the individuals. Historically, as you know, newsstands were just old wooden sheds that sold newspapers. Uh, in 2005, the city envisioned coordinated street furniture with advertising on newsstands uh, that my client would sell, and we all thought about elegant structures replacing the shacks. Unfortunately, that world has changed, and the franchise agreement itself failed to address many issues. There was no agreement between the franchisee, my client, who functioned as builder landlord, and the newsstand licensee, who was in practical terms, the rent-free tenant. Uh, we don't want rent from them, I want to be very clear. We just want to make sure we can work uh, together. The newsstand licensees carry no insurance, as was noted earlier. And prospective licensees frequently pick sites with no foot traffic, yet the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection does not have the authority to analyze the economic viability of a site. Now that people get their news online and tobacco and lottery, lottery tickets often fail, uh, we wind up with empty, shuttered structures. Uh, we would ask you to consider uh, using this intro as a broadening effort to protect uh, the franchisee, but the, new, the uh, newsstand vendors and make the system work better in the modern age uh, when nobody's buying newspapers anymore. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'd like to call James Versaki, followed by Lillian Uribe, and then Chris Lopez. James? Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Ayala. Um, actually, at this time, we're gonna reserve on comments. So, um, but uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, James. So next we'll call Lillian Uribe and then Chris Lopez, followed by a representative from the Hotel Association of NYC. Lillian? Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, council members. My name is Lillian. I was working at the Roosevelt Hotel for 22 years as a room attendant. I have two kids. My daughter is in college right now. My job allows me to pay for her college and support her. Without unemployment insurance or my job back, I'm worried that we have to pull out my daughter out of school because I can't afford to help her anymore. A lot of the jobs are out there with a minimum wage. But for me so to be able to support my family on a minimum wage, I would like to have, I would like to have two jobs. This is something that I'm unfortunately now having to think about it. I urge the council members to support this bill because I need to go back to my old job to be able to provide for my family. I really appreciate if you um, pass this law because all of us, all city is needing to open it. Everybody go back to a more normal life. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'd like to call Chris Lopez, followed by a representative from the Hotel Association of NYC. Chris? Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Chris Lopez. I have been at the New York Hilton for 20 years working in housekeeping. I live in the Bronx with my, with my, I, my daughter, 10 years old. Uh, just, uh, she just started school again this week. But, say, but at the same time, my employment insurance benefits have recently stopped it. The hotel is in vain clear or honest about reopening. And many of us are in limbo, waiting for our jobs back. I am very worried about being able to take care of my family and my daughter. I support this bill because, uh, because like the rest of my colleagues, I want to go back to work, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll call a representative from the Hotel Association of NYC, and we'll call on Danny Coley if he's available to testify now. Time starts now. Um, this is for Danny Coley. Um, uh, good afternoon, my name is Danny Coley. I'm a former body shop worker, and I'm here to support body shop bill introduction 2318. Today, I have a successful career as a member of Labor Local 79, and for the first time, I earned a decent salary with my benefits. But my role here wasn't easy. 
part of my transition back into the workforce was difficult with the body shop called Marin Laborers. Body shops like Marin preyed on the vulnerabilities of justice affected New Yorkers that know how to recruit us. They know how to keep us compliant and how to profit off the racism massacre, mass incarceration. Um, and like I said before, you know, I was coming to work uh, with low benefits, um, no medical coverage. And I feel like with no medical coverage with COVID-19 right now is a disaster. Um, I let that, you know, sink in individuals' minds. As far as the 24-hour thing, I think it's appropriate as far as the bill goes because I was a former foreman for Maryland laborers. And, you know, I've seen guys that, you know, might not even show up in 24 hours. I don't even know. Or they're not even properly trained. So with this bill, I mean, increases uh, medical, increases wages, increases training, just to keep everything safe. And as far as work conditions, I felt like I worked in unsafe conditions. And as the foreman, that was my responsibility. So with that being said, I took on a lot of situations that was above my pay rate. And, I, you know, I felt like I was taken advantage of. So hopefully that this bill can be passed. And, you know, and I just pray that you guys can see what we're looking at. And hopefully you can pass this bill. And thank you for hearing my story, and I appreciate even being on this panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you, Danny. Um, we'll call a uh, representative from the Hotel Association of NYC if they're on and available to testify. Okay, if we've inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called on in the order that your hand was raised. Seeing no hands raised, that concludes our public testimony. And I will now turn it over to Chair Ayala to offer closing remarks. Chair? Thank you. And I, I really want to just thank um, you know, uh, all of the workers that, that showed up today to, to render testimony. Um, I think that it's pretty obvious that we still have a lot of work to do uh, to ensure that uh, workers throughout the city are, are, are well protected. And, um, and I appreciate your honesty, your candor, just, you know, the ability to come and, 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 and show face is really important. And um, I commend you for that. Um, I know it isn't easy. I know that it's been very, very difficult for you. And our hope is that, you know, we will collectively, you know, get to a point where um, you're better protected and, and, and treated fairly um, and as equal partners of whatever industry you uh, become a part of. So thank you for that. Thank you to my colleagues and thank you to our committee council staff uh, for putting uh, this hearing together. And with that, I, this meeting is adjourned.